This week on Three Sides of the Coin, it's a serious show this week. I mean it. It really is. We talk about killer show, the Station Nightclub Fire, America's deadliest rock concert. We're joined by the author, John Berrylick, and we're joined by KISS's former pyrotechnician, John Watkins. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of your three co-hosts, Michael Branville. And as always, there's Tommy Summers and Mark Cicchini. Woo-hoo! How's A everybody new doing? rotational shirt. New Tommy shirt caught, rotation, caught yeah. yeah. yeah I, I, I didn't see that. So hasn't hasn't even been washed, has it? Show everybody it has not been washed, really good. right? I wore it home. Well, it's funny because I, I posted some pictures. I, I went and saw Kiss. Today's Wednesday. I saw Kiss Monday, uh, or Sunday, excuse me, Sunday night in in, uh, in in Fort Wayne. And thank you to Pat and Keith. And uh, oh, yeah. uh, you know, got to hang out with those guys. And Not you know, uh, Paul and Eric, Tommy and Gene. You know, everyone was great. And Doc, and it was awesome. So so it was great seeing everybody. But uh, I wore a Ted Nugent shirt. Um, to the show because it's in rotation. I don't pick this shit out. I just go, okay, I'm wearing it. Not that he so, can't change the rotation. But. Yeah, but why? It's not alphabetical either. <laughs> it's not. It's just, it's happenstance. So when I'm going to leave, I just go up and I go, bup, 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 three there in their suitcase and out I go. And then when I get to the, the hotel, I just throw, yeah, that, I, don't, I don't even pay attention. P- other people pay attention. I don't do it on purpose. It's just, that's just what happens. Today, <laughs> I just bought this. It's new. I bought it on Sunday. It's nice and clean. It looks good. I love. I love these long sleeve ones. Yes. Does it say anything on the back? Yeah. It says Tommy. Don't ask questions on the back. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Oh. All right. So this one won't be in rotation when I come to to St. Paul because it'll be in the wash. So I don't, that's the whole beauty. I don't know what's going to be in rotation when I get I, to St. Paul. Now I'm on pins and needles and I can't I wait to find out. What am I going to wear? I don't know. It could be Kiss. It could hey, be why Park. don't you bring it? I bet, I bet Cheryl will wash it for you to put it yeah, in rotation. It could be Wham. It could be. Because <laughs> I would have went into your closet and going, what the fuck is this? <laughs> Wake me up before you go-go. <laughs> I really like this. <laughs> All I know is Liz has got food warming. So if you fast forward to the end of the show, you'll know what I'm talking about because now we're recording the beginning. I mentioned this at the end of the show, and now we're recording so, the beginning. So, so. So, so we can get Mark out of here before he starves to death because we'll watch because him wither away right here. Because we've already recorded the big part, and the end has been recorded. Yes. Now we're back so, the beginning. A couple real quick housekeeping um, if you're a Spotify listener, hit that follow button. That would be great. Don't forget about Three Sides of the Coin Radio. It runs 24-7, 365 on Station Head. Just go to threesidesofthecoinradio.com. We've got like 20 hours of KISS and KISS-related music that is in rotation. I'm, I'm going to throw this out, see what you guys think. I wonder if we should see if anybody wants to volunteer to be DJs on our station for us. That's an interesting idea. I'm sure there will be people who would love to be a part of that. I know Mr. Zero would want to do it. Yeah, you don't need to be a professional. You don't need to commit to anything. It's just, if, are you interested? Because we can have live DJs on 24-7 if we want. We just don't have the time for us to do it, so we just let the music run. But maybe somebody out there wants to be a DJ, if that's of interest to you. Leave that as a homework answer, and we'll get in touch. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've got two special guests joining us today, John and John. John is his second time here. John, it's his first time here. And Mark, book, please. All about Killer Show. We are joined by the author of this book, John Berrylick. And we are joined by John Watkins, who's Kiss's former pyrotechnician on the Dynasty. He's really funny. 
Great guy. Oh, my God. You got to stick to the very end. He has a line that basically just. Line of the year. Yep. Line of the year. It's right up there with uh, Turd in a Punch Bowl. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Nice brevity, too, at the end. We needed it. We needed uh, because it was such. Look, guys, uh, this is. uh, this is a serious look. We goof around all the time, um, but this isn't a show that we goof around. But uh, to the betterment of the show, we're not goofing around. It uh, yeah. this this is uh, especially guys. Let's face it. You know, Kiss likes to blow stuff up. I know we all like bands. Uh, you know, everything from uh, from you know uh, Rob Zombie to uh, to Ramstein and all these other bands that like to use explosives and stuff. But uh, Big difference between the big arenas and the clubs, and uh, you know, we, we, uh, we, you know, John John Berrylick sits down with us and talks about what happened and all the various people that were at fault and had a hand in this. And John Watkins talks to us about what what he would go through on a Kiss show for dealing with inspectors and testing stuff and. Um, so there's definitely kiss related discussion through this, but listen, if you're a concert goer, you, you should have some interest in this because we've all been at a venue that could have been the station nightclub. And by the way, the the 17th anniversary is tomorrow. We, we actually changed our recording night because we thought this was so important to, to bring to you guys. And, uh, Obviously, we've already done the the, the the interviews with the gentleman, and and let me tell you, I I, I think it was one of the best episodes we've ever had. And uh, the the gentleman with their knowledge and their passion, uh, hopefully, you guys are uh, you guys uh, get something out of it. We sh- we sure did. So yep. Uh, yep. So let it roll, John Berrylick and John Watkins, Killer Show, the Station Nightclub Fire. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. So, Three Sides, we are so honored to welcome back John Watkins, the Kiss Pyro guy. Thank you, John, for coming back. Thank you, John, for helping set all of this up. Mm-hmm. And we are joined by John Berrylick, who is an attorney, but also, Mark, hold up the book, author of Killer Show, The Station Nightclub Fire, America's Deadliest Rock Concert. So this is going to be all about the Killer Show, Pyro, it's going to be hopefully very informing and educational for people. Well, yeah. I tell you what, uh, if, if you'd like, I'll, I'll start. I uh, uh, Prior to hitting the record button here, I was just telling John how life-changing this book is. And what I mean by that is I read a lot. I, I'm always reading uh, biographies and in real life history. I, I'm a voracious reader, but I never cared for, for fiction. I don't like fairy tales and stories. I like things that, or, you know, happened in, um, moments in history. As a matter of fact, I just finished reading Mike Arruzzioni's book. I just say it because it was such a great book, uh, captain of the, um, uh, 1980 Olympic team, but that's the kind of thing, not only rock star books, but real events. And, you know, if, if, you know, that story was big just because it was so much more than a hockey game and getting, you know, and keeping in that sort of theme, I go to so many concerts. I go to so many clubs. I've been going forever. Um, I've been playing in a band since, you know, since high school. And I can tell you how many times that, you know, we sometimes used pyro and, you know, we homemade stuff and man, oh man, when, uh, now at the in my mid 50s and since i read this book last year i'm so much more aware of my surroundings from where when i go out to eat to when i get on the airplane i look for the exit because uh, as we'll see when we get into this book sometimes you literally only have seconds to act and if you don't have it it may be the difference between life and death and uh um, I guess, uh, John, welcome to the show. And can you tell me what got, 
give us if you could kind of give us your background and how you came to write this book. Sure. Thank, thanks a lot for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Uh, I had been a plaintiff's trial lawyer for about 32 years, and uh, we specialized mostly in product liability and technical litigation. But Rhode Island is a small place, and it was fairly inevitable when this event occurred that the phone would start ringing. And our firm and some similar firms ended up getting the lion's share of the cases. There were 100 deaths and there were over 200 serious injury cases. And by, uh, by weeks after the fire, most families had engaged counsel. We were one of the firms that did. Uh, again, this is the civil side, not the criminal side. I can talk about both aspects because, as you might guess, when you have loss of 100 lives, people are kind of clamoring for uh, justice. And the grand jury was convened and criminal actions ensued, but not as many and not nearly as satisfying as people would have hoped for. Were you, John, before you got involved in all of this, did you have any experience in in rock pyro concerts did you only have as an attendee okay <laughs> uh you know or a backyard bomber with fireworks or whatever as a yeah, kid like, like 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 every kid with you know your little fireworks and you're blowing up army men and cars and stuff like that so so you you obviously got a huge education yourself on on this whole thing as it was moving along I, I certainly did. I knew very little about the regulation of pyrotechnics, the need for pulling a permit in each locality, the need for having a licensed pyrotechnician before you could even purchase this class of fireworks, none of which was done, by the way, in this case. And the necessity of, of acting in an excess of caution, whether that means having people in the wings with fire extinguishers at all times. Well, John Pyro guy can certainly speak to all this better than I. Yeah, I, I was actually going to use that as a quick segue to to Pyro guy here, John Watkins Pyro guy. Um, obviously, ha and and we've touched on this a little bit on your last appearance when we talked about the Pyro you did for the Dynasty tour and the Revenge tour. But more specifically, could you talk about what sort of permits and legalities and testing and safety procedures go into place when you were doing pyro at a KISS concert? It depended on the city and the municipality and the local codes and the state codes. You always have to go by the federal codes. Some now, places quick, you don't. Quick, quick question, John. Who knew all the differences in all these codes? Was that your responsibility to know city by city? Is there somebody when you were advancing a gig that you would have to call and find out, all right, what's your codes in this city? Well, the local promoter should know those. Okay, the local the, promoter would help with that. And they would pull the permit. And uh, I would, I can only speak for myself, but I would always prepare almost a, a book that would send ahead with my license numbers, a diagram of the stage, a list of all the effects, a set list. I mean, it was thick. And they'd pass that on. and they decide whether or not they wanted to uh, come inspect. How many, uh, on, on, on average, how often would a show have uh, the inspectors come out? Probably three out of four. Okay. Oh, well, I that's did it. sizable. Well, not in the beginning. In, uh, in the KISS days, Hank Schmel, my mentor, would call the fire department and ask them to come down to educate them and show them what was going on. That was way before they were doing regular inspections. And and that and 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 for timeline for people, let's keep in mind that was that was back when a lot of bands were not doing pyro of the level Kiss was doing. So it pro uh, I'm assuming rock concerts at that point were not necessarily on the radar of the local fire department, fire marshals, and stuff like that. It was after Kiss became huge, and it was like, all right, pyro, pyro, pyro. But Mike, that's another thing, and uh, John Watkins, I, I think you could address this best, but the Great White incident happened after 9-11, and I think that's when things got a little bit more serious with that's people who had things that went boom. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I lost my job at uh, Marine World because I was their pyro director. And after 9-11, they decided no more Batman uh, blow up the bank stunt show. And they went to water skiing. Interesting. So I think that kind of plays in the story a, li a little bit as well, um, just because things were heightened. I, I, I tell you what, I, I own a construction company, and um, pre pri prior to 9-11, it was a whole lot easier to get a CDL license. You sometimes just used to have to pay the inspector, and after that, um, a whole lot different. You know, um, The paperwork got a whole lot thicker. And, uh, you know, they paid a whole lot more attention to it. And I think that's another thing that that goes into the story that, you know, um, in the great white thing, just the fact that, the you know, total amateur had access to. And, and people paid the price. So that was one of the many problems, as as John Watkins well knows, before a federally licensed manufacturer of pyro can sell. They have to sell it to somebody who is a licensed pyrotechnician. The particular company, and John again can speak to this because he has personal experience with the company in Alabama, who made these fireworks, didn't care too much about that. If they wanted to sell to somebody who wanted to sell to somebody like Great White without a licensed pyrotechnician, they would just fill in the federal form with the number of a licensed pyrotechnician. They were caught doing this, and because of this and other problems, that manufacturer lost its federal manufacturing license for fireworks. An interesting note is, uh, since this is a KISS podcast, the head pyrotechnician for the revenge leg uh, of the tour, the uh, European tour, was the guy whose license they stole without his knowledge and used and put on the uh, Great White Permit. Oh, wow. And he got dragged into this thing completely blindsided. So he had to hire an attorney to defend himself, saying, look, I had nothing to do with this. I mean, fortunately, he was not sued. He was not charged criminally. It was, of course, one of the first names that the investigators looked to because his number was on the form. Right. But it quickly realized that his number just appeared on the form as a matter of convenience. Wow. Wow. The, That's the, amazing. The, the amount of of i don't know what you want to describe ineptness the amount of of just craziness that's going on fraud. And fraud that's going on with something as dangerous as pyro is amazing i i think people fail to realize you know like most disasters this wasn't just one mistake you know you look at the challenger uh space right. shuttle disaster it was not just one thing this was a critical mass of errors and I can almost step through them, that combined created tragedy. I mean, if you, if you want to list them, overcrowding the venue, illegal use of pyro without a permit, completely inappropriate pyro for the venue, uh, non-sprinklered venue, uh, use of very flammable polyurethane foam on the walls. This stuff is like flash paper, call it solid gasoline. All of these things combine to create tragedy. It's pretty discouraging when you think about it, but on the other hand, it's pretty encouraging if you think that one person in that chain doing the right thing can break the chain of causation. You know, one of the crazy things I read, obviously, in your book, John, was one of the owners knew better. Um, yeah. He didn't. He was a, a man. He sold that sort of material. He he knew the flammability of it and just didn't. I, I, again, I, I so when you guys get done with this episode, please go to Amazon or wherever you need to go. This book will will really change your life, and that's why we're doing this little detour from the Kiss world. Although it is tied in with Kiss as well, just because they make a lot of things that go boom, and we've got the guy who make things go boom for many years with them as well. But but if you go to concerts, because if you're a Kiss fan, you're going to rock concerts, you're going to clubs, you're you're doing this stuff. And, and we have a lot of very young fans, and we have a lot of fans that are our age. And it's never too late to educate yourself. And that's what we want to do today. We we want to take both Johns that we have here and combine their wisdom and, and help you guys make smart decisions the next time you walk into an arena or a, a club or whatever. And that's what we're doing this here for today, because... You know, 
I've been really fortunate over the last few months getting to know Mr. Watkins, you know, through uh, reading his posts and chatting every now and then. And, and I, I love the passion about, you know, the fireworks and the safety. And, and when he was able to get um, John on the author, I'm like, yeah, let's do this. So so let's carry on a little bit, John, with the book um, started out like those stories when you when you were talking about uh, the guys getting the free tickets and uh, like how did like how did that all come about because that was the start of the book you know you were fortunate obviously to talk to people who survived but you obviously talked to some family members and i mean how many of those stories did you actually use were there a lot that were unused i mean you that had to have been heartbreaking researching this stuff it it was it was life changing for me uh, Obviously, when there are 100 deaths and over 200 injuries, you can't tell everyone's story. So those stories that are told in the book are hopefully representative. Uh, the, there were some very pointed stories. There were stories of tragedy. There were stories of very near misses where just by happenstance, someone happened to be in the right place to make their escape. You mentioned earlier about sometimes the very limited time that we're permitted in a venue if something goes south, if there's a fight, if there's a fire. Sometimes it's a matter of seconds. In the station nightclub, it was a matter of 90 seconds, a minute and a half. If you hadn't made your escape within the first minute and a half, you stood very little chance of escape. And I talked to a lot of people who are naturally defensive because they go to clubs, they go to parties, and they think this couldn't happen. And they say, well, you know, these people were, were careless or they were drunk. I'm smart, I'm strong, I would have been faster. No one's getting in my way, I would have gotten out. And when you read the book and you study the layout of the club, you realize that whether you survived or not, had nothing to do with how fast you were or how smart you were or how strong you were. It had to do with one thing, and that is luck of location, period. That's it. That's why I, when I speak with young people, I was at a, a college just last night talking about concert safety. And these young people, of course, think they're immortal. And mm -hmm. they never give safety a thought when they walk into a venue. And what I tell them is that they have to be their own best fire marshals when they go to a venue. What does that mean? It means you look at the venue, does it look like it's kept up at all? Does it look like the staff is trained in the least? When you're on your way to your seat, trace your route. How hard was it to get there? And once you're there, realize how hard would it be to get out? look around, find the nearest exit, and before you even start to party, before you have that first drink, share with your friends. You know, if something bad goes down, that exit there, we're out of there, and we're the first ones out of there. That way you won't be the person they read about the next day in the paper. You'll live to go to another John, concert. John, John, quick question. In that, that 90 seconds that you mentioned for the station fire, was that smoke filled already was it dark was it hard to see because part part of you know one of the things and i mentioned this once in some show um you know when i fly an air fly on a plane i i have a distinct memory of an article i read by a pilot who said when you sit down in your seat in an airplane count the number of seats between you and the nearest exit why because when you're trying to get out it might be smoke filled. You might have zero visibility and all you're going to be able to do is feel a row, feel a second row, feel a third row and turn left because you know that that's where the door is. So was the station nightclub fire that way that even though it was 90 seconds, it was 90 seconds of smoke filled gases, fire, everything else that you kind of had to be able to memorize and trace your steps back because you couldn't see it to, to some degree the 90 seconds is measured by the time from the ignition to the point where someone fell in the main entrance corridor and 
immediately in the crush, people tried to climb over or throw themselves over the first people that fell. So that immediately a group of people in the main entrance corridor tipped like dominoes and became wedged in diagonally. So that even if their head and shoulders were extended to the outside, they couldn't be extricated. So all the people behind them were looking for other exits as the smoke level began to come down from the ceiling and the radiant heat from the flames on the foam was creating a heat flux that was simply unsurvivable. You mentioned visibility and, and it's unique. I've come to learn in these structure fires that the smoke layer is so opaque that it begins on the ceiling that light can't penetrate it. In fact, many of the survivors of the station fire said at one point all the lights went out. They didn't go out. The smoke layer at the ceiling was so opaque that the lights couldn't penetrate through it, so they were plunged into darkness. Also, and unlike movies, unlike movies, it's not the kind of stuff you can inhale. Also, stuff, um, I'm yes. sorry, I just wanted to add something because to go back to ignition, because I saw Kiss the other night um, on in. The one of the big problems when that ignition started is because when you're at a, a rock concert and so you have this big flame and everything, you think that's part of the show. And if you don't know any better, and this happened at the again from reading John's book, people sat and were mesmerized by the the fire for that little bit. It well, caused them enough time not to turn and run. Because if you're at a concert and you, that's what it's supposed to do. Catch your, catch your, your eyes. You, you look at the flame. See, you know, I studied that film from the the, day, the afternoon that I saw it first on television. I uh, recorded it and watched it and watched it as a professional, and it was amazing because the walls had this liquid gasoline on them. How symmetrical the uh, fire was! Yes. It came crawled right up both sides at the exact same time, and it looked like an effect. Um, not was. diminishing the pyrotechnics, but that place was a disaster just waiting to happen. It Many people, th there's this phenomenon, a crowd phenomenon called engagement with the entertainment. And you're right. People thought this is part of the show, at least for a little while. But uh, it, it, you, as you watch the film, you can see where fascination turns to concern and concern turns to terror all within about 15 or 20 seconds. Mm. So was being that it was a club, was there a certain segment of the people who passed away in an, a specific area or was it more scattered throughout the whole club and it came back down to, like you said, luck of where you happen to be standing, but also timing? Like, did the people that were in the front row perish much more than the people in the back row? Clearly, the people that were closer to the stage had a harder time getting out. Uh, those toward the back got out before the pileup occurred in the main corridor. But once the pileup occurred in the main corridor, that was where the concentration of fatalities was. If you were to do a simple body count, there were 31 bodies found in the main corridor. And just on the other side of the wall in the atrium, another 18. So that's a pretty large number of the 100 that were distributed throughout the club. Several others, about 20 to 25, were found in the far corner of the club where the office and the cooler and the men's room and ladies' room was, which was as far from the fire as one could get. But unfortunately, there were no windows or doors in that quadrant of the club. So was the thought process that they thought they'd be safe going back to that area? Yes. I mean, it's logical to get as far away from the flames as possible, but you got to get out. Yeah. Also, right. Tommy, one of the things that is so sad but so fascinating is those knucklehead owners had doors next to the stage where you could get out. John, now if, remind me: was was that you couldn't push the door open? It they 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 put it on so ass backward okay. that you had to we, know how to open it and it's an emergency effing door that when was, i'm reading the book i'm like you gotta be kidding me yeah there was 
one door right to the right of the stage, the band door, the stage door. And that had a story of its own because that was nearest a residential plat nearby. And of course, there were always complaints about noise from the neighbors. And as a result, the owners imposed two simple band door rules that the bouncers enforced. And they were that you don't open the door if there's music playing. And the only people allowed through that door have to be with the band, which are fine rules when there's not a crisis. But once a fire is underway, you don't turn people away because they're not with the band. And that's what happened. Oh, I, I, I know. know. Like how many true. senseless the deaths? The other aspect that of that door, which, which didn't limit egress that night. Yeah. John Watkins just put up a... a a picture from the book that stage door a glimpse of it can be seen on the far right of the picture yeah. uh, the state the road manager for the band is seen next to the post there with uh, a flashlight he had tried to extinguish it he couldn't find fire extinguishers the gold lame vested fella is the drummer he had made his escape from the drummer's alcove there but the, the band door was interesting for another reason, too, and that is it was a double door for sound purposes. The outside opened outward, and the inside, contrary to code, swung inward. That was it. Now, it didn't play a part in limiting anyone's egress that night, but it's very instructive as to how the club owners treated the fire code. Because for three years running, that inward opening door was cited as a fire code violation. In two years running, the owner would have a guy take the door off the hinges, the inspector would come back, check off it was corrected, and then they'd rehang the door. And you'd think after two years, the inspector would get the idea that the code wasn't being regarded very seriously. But it didn't happen. So th this, this is a, a tragedy of errors that go beyond just nightclub owners and 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 other people who did stupid things with pyro to inspectors who weren't doing their job as inspectors absolutely i mean to allow 900 square feet of this substance to cover the entire west end of the club and one of the pitches over the dance floor and this is not flame resistant it burns like a bomb uh, and allow that to pass inspection three years running is unfathomable. When the fire inspector was brought before the grand jury in the criminal investigation, he just said under oath, you know, I just never saw it. I never <laughs> noticed the fall. It, it, it's absolutely impossible to believe. The door that he cited three years for opening the wrong way had this stuff glued to it. Never saw it. And yet the, the picture that I showed was taken by a guy named uh, Dan Davidson, and he was nice enough to give us permission to use his picture. But he was the last person through that double door. Uh, he took the four, five iconic pictures that, if, if you notice, the uh, pyrotechnics are right there, and there's a security guard smoking right over the box of open pyro. Not the most safety conscious of venues. But he said when he went through the door, it was already ablaze, and he had to push through it. And thank you, Dan, for letting us use your picture. Yes, yeah. thank, thank you. And, and, you know, that was one of the things I, w I wanted to get to before we hit record when I was talking to John. One of the most fascinating parts of this book, and I've never had, uh, and the reason I, I bring up that I read a lot, because I've never had this happen in a book. John had the wherewithal halfway through the book to go, he said, okay, I told you these stories go to YouTube. I never would have even thought about that. And I stopped. And, and it's funny, um, just to piggyback a little bit of, of what we were talking about before we went on the air. When I was reading this book, my wife noticed that it was really affecting me emotionally. And I'm pretty tough cookie. And I said, you know, this and I said, and I started watching that video that you said. And again, when you're reading the book in the middle, John tells you, okay, you've read this much. Check this out on YouTube. <sighs> just you know because you're going you're here are all these people you read about and you know their fate and now you see it and let me tell you as a reader that hits you 
because when you're reading the stories, you're certainly, and it's so well written, you really understand. But then when you see it in video and the horror, and I mean with a capital effing H, the horror that quickly ensues. Because I got to admit, I saw the news, when was that, 2005, 2003? 2003. 2003. We're approaching 2003. Fe- February 20th, 2003. Yeah. So we're approaching so, 17 years. Yeah, what I remember, I was on a, a hockey trip um, in, um, up, up north in Michigan when that happened that day. I remember that day because it came on CNN. And again, just being a rock and roll guy, and I traveled to the East Coast all the time for rock concerts and Kiss stuff. We used to do all the New York Kiss conventions, and I had damn good friends that live in Rhode Island. First thing I did when I got home was start calling my friends the next day who lived out there and some of them had friends that you know were there, and so now this national tragedy all of a sudden, you know, you get a little skin in the game. So, but but anyways, you know, reading their stories and then seeing it and seeing how fast that that horror happened, it it really grabs you, man. And um and again, uh, uh the, the gentleman that filmed that. Oh, I, I, again, I'm I'm sorry. I'm I'm at a loss for words. But just just when you see it, you'll you'll understand. It's hard to describe uh, the screams and the. It's it's not for the faint of heart. I I think it's useful for your listeners though to understand why there was a broadcast grade cameraman on site that night. It's a strange coincidence. The two brothers that owned the club, Michael and Jeffrey Derdarian had day jobs. Mike was an investments guy, but Jeff Derdarian was a TV news guy. He had worked at a Boston station for a number of years, and three days before, he was began working at a Rhode Island TV news station. He was one of these guys who would do stand-ups, and, you know, he was on camera talent. Three days before the station fire, there was a trampling at a Chicago nightclub. And Jeff Derdarian thought it would be a good idea to do a piece on, of all things, nightclub safety. And what better place to get B-roll footage for your piece than your own club? In your own club. Free, free advertising. So he had Brian Butler, the TV station's cameraman, in the club for the Great White concert. And he had video rolling from before Great White went on to when the pyro was ignited never hit pause, never hit stop. He made his escape with the camera, and then he filmed from the outside thereafter for 15 or 20 minutes. So we, because of bizarre coincidence, had a really valuable forensic tool to reconstruct exactly what happened second by second. That's crazy. Uh, Crazy speech. You know, it's just... Yeah, you know when you, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm at a loss for words. I, I remember like Mark when that, when the story broke on CNN, and I don't know if this says something about us as a, as a country, but it was sort of like, oh, just another little, little fire, a little trampling at a nightclub. But and then I remember, it kept steamrolling like, more people and more people and more people, and I'm like a hundred people. Yeah. All, all, it, it just kept getting bigger and bigger as a story because the tragedy kept growing as more people were discovered, as more, you know, as more issues were revealed. You were just like, oh, my God, this is just amazing. It's one of the phenomena that occurred was I called circling the wagons. Everybody involved got their story from the beginning, and usually it was not true. Uh, Jack Russell from Great White said, oh, we had permission to use the pyro. The club owner said, we never gave him permission to use the pyro. The building, the fire inspector said they were in complete compliance. None of this stuff was true. So, you know. You know, when, when, when you've got such a mess of people at fault, 
how do you resolve something like this to go, okay, here's how we're going to bring closure to the families, the victims? I mean, can you? I mean, it's not like you can just say this one person did it. They were the bad guy. It was all their fault. This is everything from the band to the owners to security to, you know, the pyro company, everything, everything. Exactly. Well, John that's, did a great job. The civil cases took seven years to resolve. I worked on this case and pretty much to the exclusion of anything else for seven years. You know? But, you know, you're absolutely right that because of the complexity of fault, people were looking, uh, particularly on the criminal side, let's charge people with manslaughter. Yeah. Who do we put in jail for this? Okay. Well, the, the grand jury was convened, and interestingly, only three indictments issued. And they were of Dan Beakley, the road manager for Great White. He was the guy who physically connected the pyro, not the guy who made the decision to use the pyro, the guy who physically hooked it up, and the two club owners, Jeffrey and Michael Derderian. All three were charged with 100 counts of manslaughter, and all three eventually pleaded either guilty or no contest to 100 counts. Dan Beakley served 16 months in prison. Michael Derderian served 23 months in prison. And Jeff Derderian, who was there that night with his plea bargain, served no time. Curiously, not named, not indicted, were the guy whose decision it was to use illegal pirate, Jack Russell, and the guy who overlooked three years of solid gasoline on the walls of the club and overcrowded the club, the fire marshal. So how is that possible? The, I, I can speculate here. I wasn't involved in the criminal side. I was involved in the civil side. But as to the fire marshal, we have a curious law in Rhode Island. There's a statute that grants on its face immunity to the fire marshal if they mess up. Okay, what the statute's intended to do is if the fire marshal does his job really well and he shuts down your business because it's dangerous, you can't sue him. This kind of stood it on its head. This is what the fire marshal didn't do his job at all and would have claimed immunity. So I believe that he was not charged criminally because the attorney general probably didn't want to have an indictment that then was later thrown out on a technicality. There's also a phenomenon that you're probably familiar with, and that is that in the law enforcement system, there are people who are public safety officials, AG, prosecutors, police, fire, and there's everybody else in the world. And prosecutors are used to working with cops, used to working with firemen, and they're very loath to indict a uniform, mm -hmm. whether that uniform is a police uniform or a fireman's uniform. So well, then what, what about Jack Russell, then, if he was the one who made the decision to use the pyro when he wasn't supposed to? How was there no culpability there? Did he buy his way out? I don't think he bought his way out. I think it was very short-sighted on the part of the investigators. Jack met with them initially and gave interviews and said, well, you know, this was, the pyro was Beakley's idea. He did it physically. He was the one that hooked it up. And... This is my opinion, throws guy under the bus. And lazy prosecutors figured, gee, we'll need his testimony to do the slam dunk case against the guy who physically hooked it up. So we won't indict him. I, I don't agree with it. I think he was, he decided what the band would play, where they'd go, what food they'd eat, and whether they use pyro. You know, I can speak a little bit to Jack because uh, we knew each other. And uh, it's great, 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 great white, him. great white I'm not open indicting him either. I'm just asking the question. No, oh, well, I can speak to something about his mindset. Okay. If you want to go talk to Jack, don't go looking in men's meetings. That's, I mean, uh, they opened up for Kiss for part of the uh, Diamond uh, Revenge, Revenge, Revenge Tour. tour. And that's how I got to know him. And that's how I got to be their pyrotechnician for their video, call it rock and roll, which you can see on YouTube. And if you see it on YouTube, the first thing you'll notice is they load into a building that you can hardly stand up straight on the uh, stage without hitting your head on the lamps. It's a civic center. It's not even really an auditorium. So the first thing I did was said, half the stuff you guys want to do, these big pinwheels and stuff, they're not even coming off the van. 
And then the more we talked, uh, the flashes were too big. So we actually shot the big flash pots off the roof outside and filmed them and then spliced them into the video. And we did the uh, waterfall, which is a big effect they wanted. The only safe way to do that would have been over the audience's head. So that was filmed the night before with absolutely nobody on the audience floor, shot from the audience point of view at them. I never had any problem with Jack as far as telling him no. But so, I guess lack of brains is not a crime. Otherwise, a lot of us would be in jail. But um, they we're were the nicest. Sure. They really were the nicest guys to work with. And they just loved their fans. And that's not a decision they should have ever been able allowed to make. Yeah. I mean, we're not talking about a rich inner life of the mind when we're talking mm -hmm. about Jack here. But uh, it, we come back to the fire inspector, though. I mean, yeah. other people may have been terribly careless, grievously negligent, but it was only the fire inspector was the only fellow whose job it was to prevent this tragedy. So if you're going to focus culpability on anyone, I and I think most people in Rhode Island tended to focus on him. So let me ask this. Let's say he would have um, closed the club down and had all of that material uh, that was on the walls removed. Would that have considerably slowed the fire, just that act alone? The fire wouldn't have started. So that was the, the okay. This, this was the initial material that got ignited, and it was egg crate foam, open cell, dry. As soon as the sparks hit this, it went up like flash paper. And John, didn't they paint the walls with a certain, um, I remember reading that in the book, they used, I, I don't know, some sort of paint or something. Um, there was also an accelerant uh, uh, that was away from the stage, though. Is that, is that, does it's, that ring any bells? Not really. They had thrown years past, they had put some glue, spray glue and glitter on the polyurethane foam. I don't think it changed the burning characteristics that much. What we did learn, though, is that in 1996, a prior owner of the club had put a different kind of foam up on the walls of the drummer's alcove, and that was closed cell polyethylene foam. I've got a sample of it here. And that owner had literally found this foam in a dumpster, we came to learn, screwed up these blocks on the walls of the drummer's alcove, and then spray painted it black. Then the Dudarians, at least as far as the alcove went, glued the polyurethane on top of it. So you had that sandwich. That proved to be a deadly combination because the polyurethane is the perfect kindling for the polyethylene. I think that was what I was, that, that's what I remembered. Yeah. It, it, and we had, actually did an so. experiment where we shot the same type of gerbs at the polyethylene alone and it didn't ignite. But put this stuff on it, and it's a bomb. The uh, gerbs they used is a myth called the cold fire effect that uh, pyrotechnicians like to throw around for fire marshals to make them think that it doesn't burn. But all a cold fire effect means is that the spark is no longer creating its own heat. What burns out of the port of fire is what you get. It's like a spark off the grinding wheel. But if you don't think that can start a fire, that's the exact same thing any Boy Scout uses with flint and steel to get his kindling going. So you got the kindling on the wall, the flint and steel on the uh, stage, no way to get out. Exactly. John, John Watkins, can you, can you take us through um, a typical fire inspector coming out to a KISS concert? that you were at, what would you have to demonstrate? What would they be looking for? What would they ask? How long would it take? Well, I, I was lucky enough. I got to know a lot of fire marshals across the country and saw them numerous times a year. This is my lucky shooter's jacket that uh, has all the, some of the fire departments I worked with. I've taught classes in how to do pyro inspections uh, from New York to California. And I've also taught classes in pyro safety. Your inspector is going to be whoever you get in that city. Sometimes it's a guy they didn't want on the truck anymore, so they promoted him to inspector. Sometimes it's a guy that takes a real interest, and he'll talk to you and ask intelligent questions. Sometimes 
I've never had more people almost burn me than fire marshals by lighting up cigarettes in the uh, pyro room. <laughs> Just ridiculous. A typical inspection is you schedule it for around 3.30. On a professional tour like KISS, they know if there's an inspection going on that can shut down the show, everything comes to a halt during the inspection. So you have to have yourself all your ducks in a row. They come in. If they want to see something, you've got it ready to show them. Boom, boom, boom. You walk them around the stage. If they want to see it, show it to them. And then you give the stage back to the um, text and they can go about their business. Usually I'd say anywhere from 10 minutes to 20 minutes, depending on if they want to see something. Now, John, so, didn't you have to learn how to breathe fire? Well, I had to because Gene wasn't always there in the afternoons. Yeah, just so you guys know, that was something that John Watkins had to do on the Dynasty Tour, is sometimes perform Gene's fire stunt because Gene wasn't there. That's and pretty... I always, because I the inspectors was, would want to see it. Yeah, they wanted to see it. He wasn't there, so somebody had to do it. And guess who? <laughs> and, and, and so when they're there, you're not running through and... and testing and demonstrating all of the pyro it's it's just if they've got a question say well let me see what that looks like and then you set it off well the inspector has a right to see anything he's not familiar with or anything he has a question about most fire marshals these days have seen flash pots they've seen gerbs they they yeah. walk in they say okay okay you know they see the distance from the audience a uh, kiss on the end of the world tour has some effects i've never seen before with the horizontal flames i would i would be wanting to see those if i was a fire marshal those are really cool too <laughs> <laughs> hey john can you can you explain because when i first started reading the book that the first time i ever heard that called a what a juror i thought i said gerb when i was reading it but could you explain to people exactly what that is it's a it's a an expensive fountain uh just like you saw up on the fourth of july that just sprays sparks up in the air except it's got more control as far as the duration of burn and the uh, height it goes. Um, the gerbs they used that night in the station fire were too big for that stage. They could have used like a little 10-second, 8-foot one that would never hit anything. But because they didn't have a license to buy pyrotechnics, they were limited in the, amount of, in the kind of pyrotechnics that were available for them to buy. Now, on the scale of dangerous effects, gerbs are way down on the low low end compared to concussion bombs and Roman candles and aerial fireworks. Gerbs are like, kind of kiddies toys, unless you spray they're, they're them. Li they're like sparklers for the 4th of July. Uh, shot through a... Well, yeah, yes, yes, but what I'm saying, on, on the scale of dangerous fireworks that we play with, you know, a sparkler isn't necessarily the most dangerous firework somebody's going to play with on the 4th of July. Well, when Hank Schmel demonstrated gerbs to uh, Jennifer Lopez on her tour, he, he, stood, he straddled it and let it hit, it hit him in the crotch to show it was safe. I used to do cartwheels to them for the fire marshals. <laughs> Somehow I can see that, John. <laughs> uh, 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 John, d did you ever have a, an incident where the fire marshal said no? you're not using that or the show isn't happening. I've had places where they've got restrictions on certain effects you can't use. And as long as they are across the board, nobody can use them. That's fine. I ran into some problems with the uh, racist fire marshals that wouldn't let Rick James use power when they let other people. And we tried, we took action with them afterwards. Uh, John, one of the one of the things we hear about, especially as Kiss fans, is there's been the occasional Kiss show where it's like, oh, they were not permitted to use any pyro during the show at all, and the show goes without any pyro. But then, rock and roll all night, the last song, they light everything off all at once. Does that happen? That happen? Do you do? They do you, should go to jail if that's the case. So as a professional fire technician, I'll tell you right now, you don't lie to fire marshals. If they say this is the amount of powder that goes in the pot, you don't sneak back when he's having his cup of coffee and, and double it up because you're going to play there again the next year. Right. If I get someone like Jack Russell tell me, just do it anyway, and I do it anyway, I'll never work in pyro again. I, you know, I mean, it's you have to be able to say no to a rock star. 
uh, there's a funny story with Rick James. Uh, I was told you couldn't say no to Rick. And Rick came in one time. I started going, no, 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 N O N, pick a bow, you know, oh, 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 no, no, no. And Rick's laughing. I go, pick up on no, I'll say it's Rick. Yes, you can say no to Rick. And Rick goes, this guy's trying to keep me from getting fined. Why come nobody else is thinking like him? <laughs> hey, uh, speak, I, I want to uh, go back to uh, something we were talking about earlier uh, for John, the author. John, was one of the reasons that Jack Russell wasn't, I, I guess, held culpable because he didn't have very deep pockets. Did that have anything to do? Because he he was he didn't have any money at the time, correct? Well, he was sued, okay, in the civil actions, and the band had a liability policy of a million dollar policy limit. The club had a million dollar policy limit, and that was the extent of their assets. $2 million doesn't go very far when you no, have 1,200 injuries. So he was a party, technically, to the lawsuit, and his insurance company tendered their policy limit of a $1 million. But as far as affecting his freedom or his finances, I mean, he had just filed for personal bankruptcy six months before the fire. Correct. So that's not I, like that's had, what I wanted people to know. And, not and, like and, that much. And also the the gentleman that, um, if I remember from the book, the gentleman that did actually start and hook up everything, he seemed to be the most remorseful of everybody, correct? He, he Absolutely. Dan Beakley, I think, was tortured by this. He wrote all the victims' families' personal notes uh, explaining how sorry he was. It, the other involved defendants, like the Dudarian brothers who owned the club, and even Jack Russell, treated this as something that just happened to them. Dan Beakley owned it, felt terrible about it, and, and you're right. Of all the players, I think he was most sincerely remorseful. Because it, it, I reading that. You know, because it's such a downer of a book in a lot of ways. You know, but yeah. that that when I that really brought a nice human element to it that it's I don't know how to say this but comforting to know that like you said because the owners just seem so blasé and they lied so uh, damn it, much. It, at least somebody was re somebody were, was they, remorseful if this ever gets made into a movie you're gonna have to get the two worst biggest snake people <laughs> that they were they were just horrible people I mean the, they lied and lied and lied and and just, you know, looking for every excuse. And, and this gentleman, uh, you know, the, the, the guy who worked for, for Jack, he, he owned it, man. And he wanted to make things right, as, as right as he could make them. He, he and really that, did. that really brought a nice human part to the story. Well, he, he had Chris, done the exact same thing on his previous tour with um, Jackie, Jack Blackie, what, what, are, the, what are their names? Uh, Blackie Lawless. Blackie, Blackie Lawless. Lawless. With his cod piece. And he'd gotten the power from the same person he got the power from for Great White. This was not a brand new thing. With Dan, it was like he lit a cigarette in a non-smoking area, and he'd done it. Say he'd done it every night for 20 years, and all of a sudden one year somebody had stuck a load in the cigarette and it blew up. He had no idea that was going to happen. He'd done it over and over, but he also didn't bother to get the training. Yeah. yeah. I mean, he he wanted his resume bigger to say, "Well, I can do this for you," but. For him to have gotten, it would have been simple matter uh, to to get the uh, to get a federal license. It's not that expensive. It's not that hard. Well, I suspect had he had training, he would have walked into the club, seen the wall covered with this stuff, and said, "No way." When uh, Pink Floyd did the wall, and I went with Hank Schmel to work, and they first did it in Los Angeles, they dropped a drape in right before the first show. And Hank said, where's the uh, fireproofing on this drape? And they said, don't worry about it. He said, well, I'm going to worry about it. And they said, just don't worry about it. So Hank went over and did the three-second match test where he held a flame to it, and the things just started to go up. And he had to pat it out. And he goes, this can't be here. And they go, we're going to get somebody else to do the pyro. Thank you. And they did, and it caught on fire, and the show was stopped for about 20 minutes until they put out this burning drape. God. When you, look at the, when you look at the substance that was on the walls of the club, the, the marvel isn't that a fire happened that night. The marvel is that 
no fire happened in the prior three years because we had video of other bands lighting off pyro in that club. So there were other bands that did it before that. Yes. That's just dumb luck. It didn't catch fire. It said on the call sheet for that night that was posted, pyro okay. Yes. I was going to bring that. That's one of the things I wanted to bring up earlier. That it on the paper, it did say, okay. We don't know who circled it or whatever, though. But uh, uh, Well, we know that Michael DeBarian did the advance with uh, Beakley for that show. And the form has pyro, question mark? And the answer was yes. So one can draw a reasonable inference that it was discussed ahead of time and that the owners approved it. We do know that on that same tour, when a club owner forbid pyro, Great White didn't do it. John, what, what sort of changes have come about post this event? Well, in Rhode Island and in neighboring states such as Massachusetts, the fire codes have been strengthened. Uh, Lord knows enforcement of the existing codes has been more vigorous since the fire. This was a non-sprinklered building. Had it been sprinklered, the, the fire would have been knocked down and the loss of life would have been minimal, if, if any. Okay, But this was grandfathered in because while the fire code required sprinklers in a building of that size and capacity, currently, when it was built, they didn't. So it was grandfathered in. Uh, they've tightened the regulations on what places of public assembly must be sprinklered. They've required in Massachusetts that clubs of certain size must have a trained crowd safety manager there. Things like that. I mean, knock on wood, we haven't had a similar tragedy in the 17 years since. Has that fi- is that fire inspector still <laughs> inspecting? He continued as a fire inspector in that town for about two years and then returned to line firefighting duties. But after about six years, he took retirement on a work-related disability, which pays him two-thirds of his salary tax-free, plus any bumps current firefighters get. So I, I don't feel terrible for him economically. I wouldn't want to live in his head. Hmm. I and that was speak- the difference really between him and the gentleman I was talking about earlier. Um, you know, if you're if if you're part of that and you you, you got to own up to it and just to see people trying to distance themselves from it, that's when you start losing faith in humanity overall. You're like, OK, you know, your job is to protect me and you didn't protect. Yeah, me. yeah, you, you're, you're absolutely you t- right. You t- I, I assume as a fire firefighter and inspector he took some oath you took some oath to protect people and keep them safe and you didn't do that well i know in california uh at bill graham presents where i used to work after the station fire they started making safety announcements at every concert on uh the where the exits are almost like in an airplane so before the show starts they get up on the ladder and say the exits are here 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 that's that's so in Rhode Island at every venue now. Yep. But and both of you could answer this question: What sort of changes has happened within the 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 rock world, the touring world, the band world to cover all of the the the, the loopholes that allowed this to happen and Great White get pyro? You know, as have things tightened up that you're aware of? I think that the, the feds are more conscious of, of what manufacturers and sellers are complying with the record keeping requirements of only selling to licensed pyrotechnicians. I can tell you across the concert industry generally though, since the fire, there has been tremendously increased focus on event safety. There's a great group called the Event Safety Alliance that's been in business now for five or six years and all the gorillas of the industry participate in the Event Safety Alliance. We're talking about promoters, we're talking about venue managers, we're talking about roadies, riggers, everybody involved in top of the line concerts. And I've been to their annual summit and they produce a a book on best practices covering not only pyrotechnics but, but 
crowd behaviors uh, after the Indianapolis State Fair tragedy, uh, communicating weather warnings properly yep. to the group. Uh, I came to learn a lot from that group. They, they do amazing work. One of the fellows that spoke was does safety planning for multi events, and he had his run book the safety run book there a year ahead of time. And it was about four inches thick covering every possible eventuality, whether it be illness that spreads, whether it be a weather event, you know, uh, all manner of things. And of course you're dealing with concert goers who are not the most responsible or predictable people. He, uh, one of the, the fellow that did safety for Bonnaroo said, we, we use the, 80 10 10 rule something like that i said what is that he said well when you make a safety announcement that there's going to be a lightning storm coming through and would you please clear out 60 percent of the people are going to hear it understand it and act on it another 30 percent are going to turn to those people and say what they just say and they'll learn from it he said and the other 10 percent are going to be dancing out there in the rain and the lightning and we let darwin take care of them <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Mark said something interesting. First hand at a Comerica Park show, they told everybody to get underneath, and there was these jackasses doing exact. I remember saying that to my wife. I'm like, I'm, those are real lightning bolts, people. I'm like, woohoo, you know. Exactly. That's Mark was saying that earlier how his band made their own pyro. That's always going to be a problem. Um, it's one thing to buy a licensed product. But you can take someone like myself and let me lo loose at Home Depot in a supermarket, and I'll come out with something that's just as uh, spectacular as what you see on stage. I remember the band, when I was playing the at the station was, used to make their own. Yeah. When, when I was, I remember in the 80s playing at a couple small places, and they'd literally, we had a couple guys that would light, you know, cherry bombs and stuff behind the band. And that could have easily caught the carpet or something. But you, again, you're a kid. You don't, you don't think about it, and you didn't ask. You just did it. You know what I well, mean? Well, I, I, I think to you know, Gene has always said, you know, and he even did that with was it your your photo of him breathing fire last year, Tommy, where he shared it, but said, "Don't do this at at, at home." You know, Kiss has always been proactive and saying. Don't try and recreate our pyro. Don't try and recreate our show. Tommy, By the way, John Watkins, Tommy, you're you're on mute. Sorry. He, yeah, he, he, they always say just come and enjoy what we do, but don't do what we do. Don't do it at home. J John Watkins, do you know this piece of Kiss trivia? One of their very first shows, Gene put fire paper or whatever into the into the crowd and burned some guy. It was one of the very first shows. And the guy just thought it was cool that he was part of the show. And uh, Well, you know, Kiss is the whole reason I got to know John. Um, I started, uh, after Hank Schmel died, I started writing his story. I said, gee, I wonder whatever happened to those guys that, uh, from Alabama because Hank couldn't stand those people. He thought they were a hazard and a danger and they sold to amateurs and that's where they got their money. They do a big tour and then sell it to bar bands, mass marketing it. And uh, so I, I looked it up on uh, the internet to see what the uh, what had ever happened to them uh, legally, and I saw John's book and read his book. And I've never fanboyed on an author author in my life, but I <laughs> wound up writing him saying just how much the book affected me and how much I liked it. And he was nice enough to write back, and that's how we started our correspondence. Uh, John, John Pyro guy, can do you feel comfortable in explaining? Uh, the recent history of that Alabama pyro manufacturer? We got murdered after uh, yeah. I was on uh, your show last time. As a matter of fact, after we did your show, after I did your show last time, apparently he watched it because he gave an interview right after it where he said that he invented the blood that Gene Simmons spit, that he gave the recipe. He said that he was on Michael Jackson's victory tour and that they'd called him up and he said, well, that's not that Almost word for word, but I, I was livid. I called up John and said, what can we do to this guy? He's <laughs> stealing my story. And he goes, yeah, it's just going to be in Alabama. It'll disappear. But we did. Uh, me and uh, Hank's family wrote to the uh, newspapers and stuff, and they retracted their stories before he was murdered. Wow. 
John, what what sort of changes would you still want to see be made? Uh, most bands that don't need power shouldn't be allowed to use it. <laughs> it's become such a cliche. Yeah. Uh, I, I think we've probably got up-to-date fire codes. It's a matter of enforcement. You know, uh, there are economic pressures. I go and speak before uh, fire safety audiences and, you know, like the Ohio Fire Chiefs Association or their, their fire inspectors. And people come up to me afterwards and describe situations where on a local level, they're under economic pressure to let things ride. You know, uh, a fire inspector will go to a restaurant and the local councilman will meet him there and put an arm around his shoulder and say, gee, uh, I want you to meet my good constituent who owns this restaurant. You know, you want to look the other way, don't make it, don't make it sprinkler required, this sort of thing. And these... These people are under a lot of pressure. So you can have less of that on a local level if people just do their job better. And for concert goers, you know, they've got to be responsible somewhat. You don't want to put the blame on them at all. But face it, when we go to concerts, we want to kind of relinquish control. And you want to let everybody else take care of it. You're going to drink a little. You might ingest some other substances just to let go a little bit. But you can't let go completely. You got to look out for yourself. It's like when you go to the carnival. You don't put your kids on the tilt a whirl with the one tooth guy with the bottle of beer in his pocket and the how the bolts and bolts are shaking on the uh, ride, saying pass. I had a a friend from Dublin, and she talked about the bus being blown up in front of her one time and killing everybody on it. And a person said to her, "Well, how did you ever get on a bus again?" She goes, "You you get on the bus. You go to work. You live your life." You look around, if the guy looks like he's carrying road flares under his shirt, you wait for the next bus. But you go on with life. You just be smart. Yeah. And, and But, you know, I, I think to some extent, like you said, we go to concerts and we want to let go and everybody else deal with it and worry about it. But that's also because to some extent we're going there trusting that there are some professionals making sure bad's not going to happen. And when – you can't trust the professional, that's when you've got a real problem. Well, I think if you go to a major concert in a major venue, the likelihood is very high you're going to come home safe. Right. You, this concert was done on the cheap in all respects. And I tell people, why, when people say, why did the case take seven years? And I say, well, if it took place at Madison Square Garden and it was the Rolling Stones, the case wouldn't have lasted very long. You know, probably the tragedy wouldn't have occurred in the first place, but if it had, you'd know who to blame and you'd have some deep pockets to recover from. You know, life is a learning experience. Um, I admit I'm as, just as guilty as the great white knight when I was a young kid because I had a band that wanted to do uh, pyro in a place about the size of the station. And I did a, a gerb just like the ones that they used at the station. And it's no defense that I had fire extinguishers and checked all the stuff and everything else. The uh, club owner said it was okay. It was a band called Legend. We called the place the Plank House. And I remember that as soon as the fire marshal showed up, they completely said, we never said anything. Uh, uh, they completely denied it. And I'd done tests in the afternoon. But I would never do something like that again. I, I mean, I built my first plank thrower when I was in seventh grade on my mother's vacuum cleaner. I was always interested <laughs> in doing pyro. Somebody's got to be the adult in the room. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, ironically, I did a, a week-long safety symposium on the storage, handling, and use of pyrotechnics uh, three years before the station fire at um, Six Flags, New England, about 30 miles from the station. And if I'd known the station was there, I probably would have hung out there every night because that was my kind of place. Whenever we were on tour, we'd get in the taxi and say, take us to the shithole rock bar with the black walls and the amp too big and the guys were in their girlfriend's pants, you know. That's, those are my people. Hey, John, John uh, author John, John, do you still, I mean, especially with the anniversary, I think it's tomorrow, right? Yeah, uh, tomorrow. Do you, we're do we're you recording still on the 19th. People that you've met, obviously, you, you, you 
you guys meant a lot to one another because you you were their voice. Do you still stay in touch with uh, with uh, any of the folks you met through that? Oh yeah, I do. Uh, I, I'm Facebook friends and, and message with a lot of the survivors of the fire and some of the families of the, the people who died. As as upsetting and discouraging as some of the stories are, there are some real stories of courage to come out of it. One of the worst, the worst survivor, Joe Kinnan, is a, a study in courage. This is a fellow who had virtually all of the features burned off of him, who has had some 130 or 40 operations, who had a hand transplanted on, and he became a, a spokesman for the Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, has married, has had a child since the fire. Uh, you can go online, look up Joe Kinnan, and learn about his life. He, he is a profile in courage. So, there are some pretty inspirational stories that came out of this, in addition to some of the stories that just make you angry. Yeah, I just heard from uh, Linda Fisher. She was Fisher at the time. And she's highlighted in John's book. And just, she was selling T-shirts. She was a local girl. They comped her in. She was selling T-shirts by the atrium. And she laid down next to her friend, made peace with God, expecting the sprinklers to come on. And they didn't. And it was just by luck, a police officer broke, the window with his baton and, and pulled them out. And she has a message. She doesn't like to talk about the fire. She likes to talk about her grandchildren. And she's a feisty, feisty grandma. But she said, just be smart. Just know where your exits are and then go about, enjoy, you're right. You go to the show to enjoy yourself, to escape and stuff like that. Just take a moment to use a little common sense. If God gives you the choice, don't be stupid. You know, John, what you just said, um, recently I went to a show with my wife, and we went and met people there, and, and I said, we're leaving. They're like, what? I'm like, it's so it's oversold. I'm not staying. And my wife and I ended up finding us. They helped us find a spot by the exit, and we stayed and watched the show. I wouldn't have done that six months ago. It's, again, it's it's... When you, when you read this tragedy, when you see all this needless death, and again, if, although, let's face it, that was really the perfect storm. It was, a, you know, the funnel, the way to, to get in, you know, it was like, or like a, you know, a funnel. It went, but getting out, they herded you, and there was just no, again, a, a perfect storm. I, I, I remember the part in the book where that far area had a door and I think a window that was bricked in. I mean, if that would have been there, some of those people could have got out. Well, and who turns people away when there's a freaking fire to get out a side door? Idiots. That's just, yeah. I can't believe I'm they didn't just screaming at the bush. It's, you know, bouncers are not trained. If you're, you give a guy a black t-shirt and a free beer and tell him to boss people around, and you give two simple rules about the door, that's what you're going to get. Yeah. You give Hell's Angels beer and tell all my security guards you get Ultima. Yeah. Yeah. Ultima all over again. It just seems like basic common sense, but I forget that some folks don't have that. But at this point, though, too, like I said, uh, you know, with, with Liz and I not too long ago, I made a conscious decision that I never used to think of. And I think hopefully everybody who watches the show now, go out and live your life and stuff and enjoy life. But if you're in a spot that looks oversold, don't don't hesitate to say something or move yourself to a safer place. You know, and, and let's face it, um, John Watkins, we can cut this part if you want, but you had someone you love very dearly at, at, a, at a mass shooting, correct? We don't. If you don't want to talk about this, we can edit that. No, out. we're talking about concert safety. We should talk about concert can safety. You, can I, you please talk. Is that fine? I was at the Rick James Stampede in Baton Rouge, where <laughs> thirty thousand people showed up to a ten thousand event, and they stampeded, and we had to turn the uh, catering area into a, a mass unit with helicopters coming in because they couldn't get the cars in. I was also on the ACDC tour. Uh, razor's edge where kids wound up getting killed by being crushed against the stage but if i want to know concert safety i just have to go out my front door and there's a beam from the top of the luxor hotel which is right across the street from the las vegas shooting and uh 
my daughter was right on the field in front of the stage. And I've gotten philosophic in my old age. I, I, I've kind of think if you need purpose in life, just realize there are very few perfect moments in life and just collect as many as you can. And most of my perfect moments have been connected to music. So I would never tell people to stop having that experience of having your arms around your one and only while the band sings the song that you think they wrote only for you. Those are magical moments. There's two images I'm left from the uh, Vegas shooting with. One's a selfie my daughter took of her and her true love in the afternoon. Just a young couple in love, carefree. And in the background, you can clearly see the shooter's window. You know, there's a guy in there planning evil, planning, you know, loading his guns at the time that picture was taken. Took their innocence away. But my hero of that night was not, not to take anything away from the first responders, but there was a guy in a T-shirt. You could tell he was a rocker. He had his T-shirt in his back pocket, shirtless, standing right in the middle of the field with both fingers up at the, the guy shooting, just standing there going, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's how I think you live your life, in between those two moments. You yes. know? Be careful, but at the same time, you're not taking my life. You know, are you? If 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 you could give concert goers, whether it's at a big big venue or a small club like the station was, um, one piece of advice to to do every time you go to a show to help yourself remain safe, what would it be? I it's oversimplified, but I say listen to your gut. If you walk into that venue and you're in your seat and something doesn't feel right. You can't find a nearby exit. It feels too crowded. You have a rigid barrier in front of you and a whole lot of people behind you. Go with your gut and get out of there. Within a few months of the station fire, I was in a club in Oregon of all places. And I was with some friends and we made our way in and it was elbow to elbow and we made our way into a back room and as soon as we got to where they wanted to be, I looked around and I said, it took me 10 minutes to get to where I am. And I wasn't even in a hurry or a panic. I will never get out of here if there's a problem. I turned around and I left. As, as you pointed out, you know, it's changed my behavior. So listen to your gut. And if it doesn't feel right, there are other concerts. There will be other nights. When, when I was a vermin kid, we went to Altamont and... I wasn't supposed to, but I went with my big sister. And you could feel it was ugly. We were way in the back, and I got upset, and we decided to leave because you just feel this cloud of uneasiness. Something was not right. And uh, at the um, ACDC show, uh, weeks before the tragedy, we tried to take drinks out to the soundboard guys because they didn't have any, and we couldn't get there. And we got caught in this whirlpool of... Uh, and my friend said to me, somebody's going to get killed in this shit. So you l listen to that uh, little voice. It might be your guardian angel, just might be common sense. That's really good um, advice all the way around to live your life, not only at concerts or events you attend, but just in general. Listen to that your gut. Too many people think that they, they, they ignore it, thinking that, that they're just, no, that this can't be. You know, but it can it can be the decision between life and death. The, the first one of the first shows I ever went to was 72, the Rolling Stones in Winterland. And I remember not being on my feet. We were right in front of the stage and I was at a 45 degree angle laying on the people in front of me. Couldn't help it because they were laying on me. I couldn't have moved if I wanted to. I couldn't go, you couldn't go to the bathroom. You couldn't do anything. You were there for the duration. If something happened that day, it would have been catastrophic. Oh. But I didn't think of that then. I thought, Nick. Yeah, you're like Rolling Stones. <laughs> yeah, John. Yeah. John, with 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 all of the changes that have happened, um, do you think we're going to avoid something as dramatic as the station nightclub fire happening again? I, I'd, I'd hate to make a comment and jinx things. I'd like to think that in this country we're conscious enough so that something of that scale wouldn't happen. But within two years of the station fire, there were four other pyro ignited fires in nightclubs in Thailand, in Russia, in South America. So humans are slow learners. Hmm. 
it's just uh, it just weighs heavy. I, I mean, it, you know, to 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 read this story, to hear it, to watch the videos. I remember, yeah, you know, I I saw that video that Mark mentioned earlier on YouTube. It was just unbelievable. You know, you were just like, am I watching real life or am I watching a movie? Right. Uh, John Barry, like those people that are shown in the video stuck in the door, they didn't all make it, did they? The ones that are in the video that their faces are sticking out. Some of them were crushed. I'm sorry, John, you, you broke up a little. Could you repeat your question? Some of those people that are in the video didn't make it, did they? In the front door? Most, most that you see in that front door pileup did not survive. Only a handful at most were pulled from that scrum because they were so locked in. Even if their head and shoulders were exposed and they could be pulled on, they couldn't be extracted. So I don't know the exact numbers, but most deaths at the station fire were not from burning, right? Most of them were from being poisoned, uh, smoke inhalation, and being crushed. And then exactly. the one gentleman who was fortunate to fall on his side that was the, for me, that part of the book was, I don't know how you, how you put it. This, and uh, I, again, read the book. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to make light of the situation, but there is a story in that book where a gentleman survived that when you read it, it is what a twist of fate, how fortunate that that, that man was. Um, and again, I, I, I get this book. It, it, uh, Killer it, show. Yeah. Um, it is. Uh, I, I, you know, and, and, and I think to go along with get the book, you, you've got to respect pyro. If you're an amateur, you shouldn't be doing it. And, you know, if you're going to a KISS concert, have some major respect for the professionals that – are going through all of the hoops to keep you safe, to do it the right way, to protect the band. I mean, that that's the one of the biggest things. I at a Kiss show, I'm like, how has the band never gotten burned? James well, Hetfield. Look at what James, to- James Hetfield got burned by a flash pot. Yep. Well, you know, and Bobby and Hairball. Remember yeah. Remember his hair started on fire. I think that was actually a year ago today that that happened. Yeah, it's possible. Well, and I think the other thing I want to touch on, too, because I go to a lot of shows a year because I'm shooting so many of them. Um, I see some people and I'm all for having a good time, but it's amazing to me. And I don't care if it's country music or if it's metal or whatever, that are literally there. The people are so freaking hammered. They don't even know where they are. And I've always thought to myself, okay, what if there is a fire or a, a problem? You ain't getting out. And secondly, what's the point of spending $100, $200 on a ticket, waiting for a show that you love this band, and then you get so freaking drunk that you don't remember it anyways? So it's like, take a like little pause said, here. Like John said, was, that's Darwin in action. Darwin in well, action, exactly. Well, yeah, because like one of the last Kiss shows we were at, there was a group of guys in front of me and they must have gone to go get beer six times during the show and every time they came back they each had two cups so we didn't get some percentage of that so well yeah but they were they couldn't stand by the time it was over and i'm just thinking you can you can use that as a learning moment i did with my son my son's 27 now and i started taking him to concerts when he was like 10 and because he, he loves the same kind of music i do because he grew up with me yeah. but i'll never forget he wanted to go see i it was we went and saw iron maiden and black sabbath at Ozfest, and he was probably 12 at the time and there was two guys and if you guys remember Ozfest, it was an all-day festival as we're walking in there's these two guys passed out drunk by a tree and I said to my son, I'm like, see those two idiots? They each paid 100 bucks, just like we did. Guess who's not even going to get into the show? Drinking's cool. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, um, yeah. it's a nice learning moment, too. I mean. Teachable moment. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's it's that. Look, that's something you have to experience, I think, to learn not to do that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, I look. You know, we're all, at least the hosts of the show, we're all in our 50s, and we still see that crap. I don't understand it. You know what I mean? I just don't 
Why? Well, you know, it was it was somebody had mentioned it earlier here. When you're young, you think you're invincible and nothing's going to happen to you and everything is fine and you're not worried about it. It's as you've lived life, seen these events, heard about these events, been touched by these events that that the smart people start changing habits. And, you know, you walk in and you're going to always be aware of your surroundings at a at a concert and an event. What's, what's going on so- behind me? What's going on in front of me? What What's that ruckus off to the right side? Do I need to be moving away from it? You know, that comes... When you get to be our age, you don't you know enough to go to a concert. That's, the music is good enough that you don't have to drink beer. It's right. livable. Well, right. yeah, you know, you, you, you also... There's something to be said. It's like if a band can't do a show without pyro, is their music good enough? I mean, you know, if if you have to have pyro to make a good show, well, then is your is are the songs that that great that they wouldn't stand on their own? Because some of the best Kiss concerts I've been to were pyro-free concerts. Yep. Yep, that acoustic one that I was at in South Dakota was probably in the top three of all time for me. Well, and also, too, the other piece of it is, is like with these guys I was telling you about, they're all hammered. Why not have at least just one sober driver so that you guys can get people out and you're kind of keeping your head clear? I don't know. We're preaching now. Yeah, Dad. Well, go sit on the couch. I was counting on, uh, speaking of safe and prepared, I was counting on Mark to give me the signal if I uh, got too dry this time, because I, I brought my spitzer, so because I got too dry, I could prevent a fire. <laughs> hey, hi, Roger. I actually, uh, um, I actually got a text today from, because we, we get the craziest stuff that people ask us and this one was really and you're going to be the one that has to answer this i have no this is i don't understand why people ask us this kind of stuff i have no effing idea somebody said wow i went to the new kiss show that's the most pyro they've ever had how much does it cost per night for pyro i'm like how the hell do i know and then i went dot 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 hey our guest might know tonight i'll ask them so if you could just ballpark on a, on an average show, what would it cost to for make all those booms? They're absolutely right. There is more pyro on this KISS show than they've ever used before, than anybody's ever used before. And they have eight technicians on the road. So I can't even begin to guess how much just in salaries and transportation and rooms and let alone product insurance. I think a a fair estimate back in the day would be about four thousand. Okay, so there you go. If it was, if it was a one only, it'd be like ten thousand. If it was only one show, you had to bring everything in and design it, build it, stuff into it one time. Ten, taking the road probably around four. Okay, so around four. There, he's got his. Uh, that came into our our. Did you guys see that today? No, because that came in through three sides. So. I just said, hey, I don't know, I'll ask our guest. So there you go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> See, we we analyze, we analyze, we talk to the people that know to get you people the answers you want. The experts. Uh-oh. Oh, hey, there I you got go. one of those, except mine's red. Firehouse. You know, I'm surprised Mr. Berlick agreed to do this show. I don't, I mean, usually people that's distinguished, once they find out that they have to sing their favorite Kiss song, I got told to take it out. They usually <laughs> back out. Uh, which song are you going to do for us tonight, John? <laughs> uh, I, I'll, I'll do the normal finale. I, I rock and roll all night, <laughs> every day. <laughs> nice. And 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 John, you set off all the pyro while he's he's singing. There you go. Yeah, everyone I'll get out your confetti. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, guys, this was this was great. great. I mean, you know, it, it's it's such a tragedy. But it's it's great to talk to John, who who was the lawyer, who was the author of this book, and the other John, who is a very experienced pyrotechnician, and get your actual comments on something as significant as the station fire. 
And I, I respect you guys for kind of breaking your normal thing to do it in the interest of public safety. It, hats off to you. Thank well, this you. is important. It's well, important. Yeah, you know, at, at the end of the day, we do shows that the three of us as fans would be very interested in. And we kind of hope that the majority of people would have the same interests. And I think this will apply to a lot of people. We, you know, we've all been to clubs like the station, been to clubs worse than the station, bigger than the station. You know, this this can this touches everybody, especially if you're a live concert attendee. If you're still active, going to shows, and I don't care if they're big shows, indoor, outdoor, um, they've all got their own little things but, you need but Michael, to be concerned about this pertains to sporting events too if oh you yes guys know, yeah happen, I, look i i as you guys know I, um you know i go to a lot of football games and this year they had a pyrotechnic tip over start the field on fire and guess what they did they took all the pyro out of the nfl the yep. following week and now they just have a bunch of you know dry ice and colored <laughs> clouds that go up now um, all it took was the one. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. But, uh, you know, I, I, the, to tell you the truth, I, it's a good thing. You know what I mean? Um, well, you know, and, 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 side and, of caution. and maybe John Watkins can come on, comment on this. But it, it seems like in the past few years, there's a lot more stage effects that look like pyro that aren't pyro. Right. You know, whether, yeah, whether there's, it's, there's it's, also transvestites that look like women that aren't. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I mean, thank here. you very much. We can't follow that comment up. Oh, my God bless ACDC. There's two sounds or two things you cannot reproduce through speakers. One of them is the sound of a bell. And so they wouldn't have their own humongous bell cast just to get that true resonant sound. It was a sledgehammer at the beginning of Hell's Bells, and the other one is a concussion. That pop in the chest of a real explosion going off for uh, those about to rock me to lose to. Yeah. And, you know, they've got so many great songs, and they're not a band anymore, but I, I wouldn't play for those about to rock me to lose to. It's be going through the PA. I mean, it'd just be embarrassing. True. Very true. I tell you what, the bombs that, are kiss, that Kiss is using now, Holy shit, man. It blows your heart out the back of your chest. Those are uh, quite impressive. Uh, One time on Dio, they wouldn't let us use pyro someplace. And I tried to get him to get two girls in uh, bikinis on headsets with me to hold up signs that said, pow. (laughs) 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 He wouldn't do it. Oh, goodness. You know, John, like David Lee Roth would do. That doesn't seem like uh, like a Ronnie James Dio sort of thing. Before we end, did you did you feel the chemistry? Because I think I think we kind of a have a public safety love line thing going here. Like you could be the mature Dr. Drew to the wacky comic. Yeah, you one. two should you should you two should start a podcast. <laughs> Go. No. <laughs> no. Thank 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 you both of you, Johns, for for taking the time out to sit down and talk about this and share this and you know. Hopefully, you know, some of our listeners will walk away from this going, okay, I'm going to pay attention a little more. Yeah, and pick up the book. It's available everywhere. Amazon, you know, Barnes & Noble, everywhere you can buy a book, I believe. Correct? Yes. Yes. Look at this thing. Every page, every page is highlighted. There is over 100. (laughs) I've read this book. (laughs) You know, I, I, I would say if you are an active concert goer we've all probably been in a club like the station that was a time bomb waiting to go off and you just didn't know it and and come coming to my mind and i won't name the clubs but i can think of a couple that i used to go to a lot that i'm just like oh that was just a disaster waiting to happen oh yeah there's a few in Chicago I can think of that I'm like, ugh. Well, oh, that, that's where I'm thinking. Is yeah. There are a couple in Chicago where I'm like, very low ceilings, like you could stand on the floor and touch the ceiling. Yeah. And basically two entrances, one on the this side and one cow. in the back. And it was just, 
you know, of course, people are smoking in there, and you're just like, oh, you know, and then they pack. And on, and so many of these clubs, it's like, yes, capacity is 500, but if we can put 750 in, that's more money tonight. Right. Yeah. You know, of, of all the conversations that John Berlick and I have had, I think we've agreed that the one word that sums up the biggest danger in all of this is greed. Yes. Yeah. That's what it comes it's, down to. And you can tell when a place is oversold, you know, and we're not talking about, you know, uh, going to a large venue to see a KISS show, but those clubs, you know, when they've sold too many tickets, because you just, you can't move. You can't, They were you writing the, the, the ticket on the back of a pizza coupon. <laughs> when, that when, happened when, in this, I don't remember when, exactly when you're, when you're was, at, but... when you're at the front door and there's a line of a hundred people behind you, and as soon as you step cross the threshold of the front door it's solid people it's oversold mm -hmm. yeah and people get that's the other thing too is i've noticed like even when i'm trying to go from say like the pit back to the soundboard when i'm shooting photos people get really territorial at some of these as well so that's the other thing to take in consideration they may be oblivious to what's going on around them and they're not going to let you through simply because they think you're going to somehow stand in front of them yeah. so that's another reason to be even more aware of your surroundings when I talk to concert goers about being aware of the nearest exit, sometimes that's not enough because you can be the first one to know that fire isn't part of the show. And you can be the first one that knows that the nearest exit is 30 feet to the right. But you're at the mercy of the people in front of you, behind you, on either side of you. Yep. So and, that's and, the, and the security fire. guard standing at that door. Right. Yeah. If you yeah. want. Yep. Yep. Um, again, thank you guys so much. Bit of bit of a so, sobering discussion, but a valuable discussion. Thank you for the invite, guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much you for joining and us, guys. Thank you, John, for setting this up, man. It, this was. I, I tell you what, I know that our the people who watch the show are going to dig this because when when whenever we do go off on it on something a little different from kissing, let's go. Let's be honest. We did keep a little kiss in here. Um, we get a lot of we get a lot of thank yous, and I think this one. Look, we may have just saved at least a life. Yeah, I I know that sounds crazy, but we might have, and that's worth its weight in gold, man. Well, you know, it, uh, not to take more time, but when I speak with fire prevention people, people whose responsibility it is to enforce codes, I tell them they've got a weird job in that if they do their job really well and they prevent the next station nightclub fire. They'll never know. Nobody will ever know about it. It will never make the headlines. But if the next station fire happens on their watch, they'll never be able to forget it. Exactly. And that's that's what we should leave with. Yes. I agree. Thank Amen. you. Thank you, gentlemen. This was a real pleasure. Thank sure. you. Guys. Thanks, guys. Okay. Take care. Um, you know, thank you for everybody who stuck through and listened to that. It was, I think, an important discussion. Yeah, we, we learned. A, we we as Mark said, we touched on Kiss a little bit here, but um, man, be smart. You know, like he said, follow your gut. If you just are feeling uncomfortable, there's a reason you're feeling uncomfortable, and get yourself out of that situation. Yeah, and I, I that's why. I mean, I think this is important. It's for everybody's safety. We want all of you listening to be safe and all of your friends and family. So share this information with other people that don't listen to this podcast. You know, you might save someone's life someday. You know, one, one of the things that's always, I always seem to think about when I hear stories like this and tragedies like this is like, how lucky was Kiss in the mm -hmm. very early years when they were making their own pyro? They were, do I mean, we've seen plenty of photos where the flame pots are going up and spreading out across the ceiling of some small venue that they were in. Mike, how Mike. lucky that something never happened to kiss at one of those. Mike, how about this? How about the 70, was it the 70 January 75? I don't remember the exact, but what was, the, wasn't it New Year's Eve when Gene did the flash paper? I remember that. Yeah. It was one of the very early gimmicks that, that came yeah. from the fire breathing where it's like light it, throw it out in the audience. And someone got there, obviously Gene burning himself, obviously Moose getting hurt with, uh, well, when he got burned. But also, how about the Black Oak Arkansas gig where Kiss set their their uh, Black Oak 
curtain on fire. How about the curtain that started on fire at the was it the weenie roast? The weenie roast yeah. up in the up in the up in the um, correct. Yeah, the rafters. And when I see the pictures of that place in, uh, I think it's in Louisiana, uh, in New Orleans, the warehouse, that place was yeah. just a big wooden barn. Mm-hmm. I mean, matchsticks ready to go. Yeah, I mean, it, it really, think about what Kiss did back then with the, you know, especially during uh, like the middle of 100,000 years, you feel right with the flamethrowers. Yeah. So, I mean, really, they. I don't know. They were lucky. Tip of the hat to the well, guy, to the road crew and and even the concert goers who would shoot off bottle rockets and and M80s and you know all that stuff. It's, yeah, it's funny because both the uh, Aerosmith live bootleg and also on Ted Nugent's Double Life Gonzo, there's parts in both those shows. Where, pow pow! We hear all the fucking you know the all the fireworks going off. Yeah, that I remember that as a crowd. kid. And, and you're like. Who, I remember saying, who the fuck throws firecrackers? But, I mean, I've seen that happen at concerts. Not yeah. so much now, but I, tell, you, tell you the truth. I remember that, I want to say 1980 at a Van Halen show. Someone that just seemed like they threw a brick of fucking firecrackers off tier A in, at Kobo. And that the firecrackers seemed to go for two minutes. And I'm just... It's probably a whole brick. And I, that's what I mean. And I'm like, who the... F- a, why did you... Who's that stupid? What is you know? that? What 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 is the purpose of that? But but you know we can say that when we're in our fifties, when you're eighteen years old going to the concert, fuck yeah, man! I'm bringing some firecrackers to the show. <laughs> fuck, it's gonna be so cool, man! Watch this. Look out, David Lee Roth. Yeah. <laughs> oh, by the way, speaking of David Lee Roth, great. Um, uh, great show. I, I went and saw Kiss in Fort Wayne two nights ago or three nights ago. Fantastic. Um, let me tell you, I, I, I had this, this talk with somebody, because we'll, we'll get back to a little bit of Kiss discussion now. I, I've said this before on the show, and I'll say it again. This opening rivals any other opening oh, this, of a Kiss show. Yes. And what I, Best what I support act they've had in decades. To the, Especially to the original four. And, and look, it's my favorite era of the band, too. Everybody loves the original band. That, that, that's what got me into Kiss. But I got to be honest. If you watch the Tiger Stadium show when they came out on Deuce, compare that to what you're seeing now when they come down from the pods with the... Look, dude, this show now is the shit. Kiss, hey. it's... Kiss has never been more bombastic. The show has never been fucking better than it is now. I, I, yeah, I, the photos I, we're sharing. Yeah, oh. Tommy's photos are, are amazing that we're sharing on. And it was on like John, it was nice earlier. If you remember, John, I don't know if we were recording yet when John was talking about the sideways flamethrowers. Yep. Remember, if you haven't been to the show yet, and if you haven't, what's wrong? Unless you live somewhere they haven't played, but I think they played pretty much everywhere. But look. The, the opening of the end of the road tour shows, there's nothing fucking like it in history. With I'm talking for pure bombast, pure spectacle. Yeah. It, they, I, 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 I always, this. I always get a little chuckle when I see somebody online sharing that photo of of the Alive Two inside cover, and they go, "This will never be." repeated this is the greatest show ever and i'm and i'm like well technically guys let's compare that to this first of all there's 24 lights on that alive two stage that's it and the picture's fake and and it's all the pyro going off at once to give it that look compare that to kiss this year yeah that that that's like lighting a little match stick off that alive two was a little match stick yeah you look at what they've got now for the amount of lights, lasers, pods, and people. Stop counting the frickin' pods, okay? <laughs> I saw someone I saw someone ever wrote that. Jesus Christ, there's people counting about yes they are and they yes, guess they are. what? They ask us about it. Like they, they, we get, they, they get upset that there's only nine pods and that's a sign that the tour's failing. Shut up and go get a fucking life. Okay? <laughs> Really, it's not a big deal. But you look at the show, everything they've got now, 
I'm sorry, this blows away Alive 2. Recreate the Alive 2 in, inner cover with this band on this tour, and let's see how it stacks up. Right. That's a very good point. Light off all the pyro on the end of the road tour at once. I'd like to see that. <laughs> and, and, and look, you're, to anybody who's going, oh, see, they're dissing the... No, we're not. We love Alive 2. We love... That's awesome. Yes. It's iconic. Alive it's incredible. 2 is better than but, Kiss Alive. But if here's, you're, here's, if, here's, if, here's if, the other if, thing to keep in mind. And I'm talking physically, oh. much like I said earlier, the concussion bombs are using now. Holy shit, they put your heart through your back. They just yep. didn't have the technology back there like the, what they have now with the hydraulics and this crazy, the pots. Oh, my God, this new show is just insane. Well, and the other thing to keep in mind, too, from my perspective in watching it and taking pictures is the Live 2 inside, okay? And I love that. I'm not knocking it. But that is the culmination of everything, like Michael said, going off all at once, grand finale. A staged okay? photo. You get... The grand finale, a half a dozen times through the show. And every single time it's different. Because, like, if you look at the pods coming down to Mark's point, and then you look at Psycho Circus, the beginning of that, the beginning of Deuce, the uh, beginning of um, uh, Black Diamond, they're all specifically different. Bombastic. That, that, that one, two, three hit it part in Black Diamond. That those those spectacular effects that go off, you know, those sparklers or whatever. I don't because I'm not a pyro guy. But, but more than that, though, the puffs of smoke that come up and illuminate. Point is, is that you're going to see at least that a half a dozen times. Not to mention a variety of other things throughout the whole deal. And then also too, I want to say they stepped it up with lighting because when you see how cool Parasite is. I would tell you that of all the songs they do in that show, Parasite has the coolest lighting of the night. And what they do is it's a it's like a goal, a very bright gold lighting, and they bring the pods down to kind of surround the band. It's just it's cool. It, it, there's so much more functionality to it than just the pyro. It's also the how they use the screens. And then also what they're putting on the back of the screens and the imagery there. It, it's it's something I've you got to see it. That's, yeah. Tommy's now speechless. I am. I, I you, just, you, I, you know, I get to see him again. A, a, after all of that has been said, if you ever have the opportunity to run into one of the Kiss Road Crew guys, thank them for everything they do to put this show on, to keep the band safe, point. to keep the audience <laughs> safe. They work Hours, hours, hours in crappy cold conditions sometimes to make this happen. And, you know, to our discussion here, it's when a professional does their job, nothing happens and nobody has anything to complain about. So be thankful. Be thankful that yeah. you walked in and walked out and nobody got burnt, that Paul Stanley didn't get his hair burned or, you know, God, Eric Singer, Christ, he should just be cooked. We're, just being in vicinity of those flames back there on the drum kit, he ought to be cooking from uh, the inside. Yeah, you'd think. Because those flames, those those vertical flames are just, or horizontal flames are just you can, you can You can feel the heat in the audience. What about the guy who's sitting four feet away <laughs> from it? Yeah, and that's 20 rows back. I know. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah. You know, pyro's not something to be messed with. Don't do it, you know, as as Kiss always says, don't do it at home. Come to the show. Enjoy when Kiss does it. But don't try and recreate breathing fire. Don't try and recreate and build your own pyro. Yes, we all did it when we were a little kid, when we were stupid. You're not supposed to be stupid when you're an adult, okay? Be safe. All right, make for the better stories. <laughs> <laughs> you'll you'll ha you'll have a story we'll for your that out soon enough, won't we? <laughs> you'll, 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 this weekend. you'll have a story for your grandchildren when they get old enough to ask. They'll go, Grandpa, why is the side of your arm burnt off? 
Well, let me tell you, I tried to be Gene Simmons, and I spilt the lighter fluid all over my arm. Yeah. Stick to stories like chapstick versus chopsticks. Exactly. <laughs> International sign. The international sign for chopsticks. Speaking of that, uh, I have chicken fajitas awaiting upstairs, gentlemen, so... Okay. All right. All right. So, so this is the international hold, sign for let's wrap. How was it? The Dave Chappelle, the wrap it the fuck up. <laughs> home, home, homework. Homework. Have you have you read the book? You know what? What's your take on all of this? Have you changed any of your habits because of what happened? Do you do anything even a, a little bit different because of what happened at the killer show? Can't see what's anything that? but a bright white light. Uh, let me know when you're going to read it. I, I, it, now it, it, turned, off. it turned off. Can you just read okay, it to us? <laughs> Liz, do you want me to warm up your food? Oh, I thought it was like something important, like Gene saying. It is important. We love you, Mark, but no, it's food. <laughs> <laughs> All right, homework, you know what to do. Um, of course, if you're watching us on YouTube, hit that little red subscribe button. Follow us on Spotify. Give us a review and a rating on iTunes. Do all of that or pick one of them. Um, it means a lot to us. And um, that's it. I Let me let me double check before I say this because the last time I said this, somebody got a little, little upset. Um, do we have a guest? Oh, gosh, yes, we have a guest. I'm not going to spill. Well, I sort of spilled the beans on this in one post on the the posters Facebook group. We've oh. got a guest next week who attended the great kiss off finale at Woodfield in Chicago. Nice. How cool is that? Somebody who was actually there. That's very cool. And he's got a bunch of other great stories beyond that. I don't know anybody who has actually ever attended a kiss off event. Not that I'm aware of. So Oh and I gotta say thanks to my friend Bob for getting me a carrot cake beer, which I was enjoying during the show. Carrot cake. Yes. So, look, so Bob and your beautiful wife Jody, thank you for the carrot cake beer. The closest we can come is we knew someone that was selling um, fake posters of it. <laughs> <laughs> He's dead, isn't he? <laughs> Yep, to me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. my God. All right, guys. That's it. Three sides of the coin. We're out of here. We'll see you next week. See you, guys. Love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to iTunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.